Good evening. I'm going to await um, till some people come on. I uh, hope that everybody is staying safe, staying prayerful, staying positive, staying hopeful, staying compassionate, staying kind. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to wait until a few more people join. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody that's joined by Periscope. Um, I hope that you are staying safe. I hope that you are staying hopeful. I hope that you are staying compassionate. I hope that you are staying wise in this hour. Um, I'm going to wait until a few more people join by Facebook, um, by Twitter, by uh, Periscope. Um, it is good to connect with you tonight. Um, we are keeping the whole world in our prayers. Um, this is a very difficult time for all of us in so many ways. This has challenged and test, tested us in who we are as a humanity, who we are in our faith, who we are as family members, as loved ones, as friends, as neighbors. And um, I believe that we will be better through this. So um, I'm gonna wait just for a few more people Good evening, Jerry Chang. Great to see you too, my classmate. Uh, William Thomas, good evening, Junior. William Thomas, Junior. Glad you could connect tonight. Kimberly and Porter, glad you could connect with us tonight. I have my father in the background. Um, just to remind us that we will get through this. He said it on April 3rd. He said, we got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. And like any man, I'd like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. And I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight, I want you to know tonight, I want everybody listening to me tonight, whether you're on Facebook, whether you see this via Twitter, uh, Periscope, um, Instagram at some point, that we as a people will get th through this coronavirus. As my father said, we will get to the promised land. That was a prophetic utterance by my father. And we have to hold on to that. He reminded us in 68 that we would have some difficult days. And we collectively now, it doesn't matter what your economic class, it doesn't matter what your race, your ethnicity, your gender, your sexual orientation, your religion. Um, it doesn't matter uh, which generation you were born into. We've got difficult days and we're in those days together right now. But we will still get to that promised land uh, that he spoke about. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and dive in. Um, there's some, something I wanted to share tonight um, because my heart is extremely heavy. Um, and um, I'm going to first, uh, I'm going to first share my statement um, that I have related to the news um, that came out earlier today regarding um, our governor here in the state of Georgia, Brian Kemp, reopening some of the businesses by executive order um, in the state of Georgia. Um, and so I'm speaking first and foremost to all of my brothers and sisters in the state of Georgia 
but I'm also speaking to the nation and to the world because what I say here hopefully will resonate with people all over this world with those of us who call ourselves humanity. Um, and so first let me um, express my condolences, my sincere deep condolences um, to those who are mourning uh, the loss of loved ones who died due to, to the coronavirus. I also want to express my personal gratitude to the many men and women who every day are on the front line serving us during this time, whether it be in the healthcare profession, whether it be in our grocery stores, our drug stores, you know, um, our Walmarts, our Targets, those who are delivering our mail, those who are delivering um, uh, different items to our home homes. Um, we want to thank them uh, for putting their their lives on the line literally every day to make sure that we have essentials and necessities on a daily basis. So we give our appreciation to them and I'm gonna encourage each and every one of you, when you're at a store, when you're shopping, um, um, when you encounter um, those people who are a part of our sanitation workers, if you remember my father, uh, was protesting for the rights of sanitation workers when he was assassinated. Uh, we need to thank these people. We need to do something special for them. Um, so when you're at the grocery store, when, when, when someone's coming to pick up uh, your trash, when the mail person is delivering your mail, when people are delivering other things, when you're in the drugstore, let's, let's give them the expression of our gratitude, just as we do when people serve uh, in our military. Thank you for serving our country right now because that's what they're literally doing. They're serving our country. And if you don't live in this nation, they're serving your country. Um, and so we want to thank them. Uh, I want to challenge you if, if you can in your neighborhood, if you got chalk, you know, right on the driveway to those sanitation workers. Thank you for your service to humanity because they are serving humanity right now. And we need to uplift them um, and, and give them our appreciation. But this is a very devastating uh, hour in the history of our nation and of our world. Yet, I want you to know that I continue to have hope and hope that you have hope. Um, and I believe that COVID-19 will not defeat us. I want you to hear that. It will not defeat us. We will emerge as a more compassionate nation with a greater love for humanity. During this uh, global crisis, compassion includes doing what is safe and demonstrating dignity for all people and all communities. We must esteem lives which we cannot recover higher than we esteem profit. In 1967, my father wrote a book Night, where do we go from here? Chaos or community? I recommend that you purchase that book. You can purchase it through the kingcenter.org um, at our shop. Um, he wrote in his in his in his in this book in the last chapter called The World House. And he cautioned us. And I want you to hear this because this was 67 as a caution and as a challenge when he said we must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-centered society. This means shifting from an economic-based society, a business-based society, um, a money-based society to a person-oriented society. And this brings me to the reason why I'm sharing with you tonight. As many of you uh, probably know by now, our governor here in the state of Georgia Brian Kemp made a decision to reopen effective this Friday several types of indoor facilities and venues, including gyms and bowling alleys, nail salons, and hair salons. I want you to know that um, I personally learned of Governor Kemp's briefing and his plans to reopen via a text message, not from someone 
from his office, but from a friend. And like many of you who are here in the state of uh, Georgia, I'm extremely concerned about uh, the governor's plans and what his decisions will mean for the safety, health, and lives of Georgia residents with the possibility of impacting neighboring states and the world as Atlanta is a hub for global traffic. I'm particularly concerned about populations that are most affected by the virus, including marginalized communities and disenfranchised populations. It is well known and has been conveyed by scientists, medical professionals, and data that the coronavirus is proven to be especially dangerous for members of my community, the black community. To be clear, and I want you to hear this, to be clear, neither I nor any member of the committee that I co-chair, the Community Outreach Committee of Governor Kemp's Coronavirus Task Force was consulted or informed regarding the reopening of the venues and facilities that are listed in the executive order that he signed on today. I've spoken with other committee members and we have questions that we will share with Governor Kemp and his answers to those, uh, his answers, excuse me, regarding our concerns will determine if I will continue to serve on this committee or if I find an alternative way to serve the people of Georgia during this crisis. As I shared in my initial statement about assuming this role, I will continue in this capacity as long as the committee reflects a commitment to progress and to being just and humane. Not just the committee, but the commitment of the state of Georgia to progress and to being just and humane. I and the other members of the Community Outreach Committee will share any feedback we receive from Governor Kemp regarding our questions and concerns. I want you to know and be clear about this. I am accountable to you, the people of Georgia, my brothers and sisters who reside in the state of Georgia, I'm accountable to my conscience and I'm accountable to my God. I encourage you to stay wise, stay home, shelter in place. If you have to go out, yes, use wisdom and stay safe. That ends my formal statement, but I wanna just share this from my heart. Today, when I received this news, the first response that I had was tears. It was devastating to hear. It was difficult to hear. And it's difficult because I'm not sure that we are understanding the importance of balancing the economy with a commitment to humanity. I want you to hear that. I get the need for people to go back to work. I have a, I have a personal business. Um, I manage the King Center here in Atlanta, which is the official living memorial to the life, work, and legacy of my uh, father, and I dare to say my mother as well. So I get the importance. I, I get it that people's pockets are hurting and we've got to find a way to restart the economy. But we have to use wisdom in how we do it. The problem is that we are not doing enough testing. And in the absence of that, we are creating a higher risk factor. And I am afraid like so many other people, what I say, I will say I'm concerned because God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. But I am concerned deeply that we're setting ourselves up to see accelerated deaths, especially in communities of color, communities that look just like me. 
vulnerable communities, marginalized communities. And so um, it is my hope as governors across this state, as mayors across our cities, as they are gathering many of them now with experts to determine how to effectively open the economy, because yes, at some point we can't stay sheltered in. We've got to figure out a way how to re-emerge from what we find ourselves in, that we will heavily weigh the cost of human life and what it is we need to put in place to ensure that we lessen the impact. Because right now we are not prepared and we've heard it all in the news that we have to be prepared. We have to make sure that people have what they need. I was listening to a young lady who serves on the subcommittee with me tonight and she was talking about and how Taiwan, they literally make sure people are prepared, that they have what's needed when people come into their businesses, that people are properly uh, protected. And so not just the workers, but the folks going into the business. Um, and so I don't know what all of the things are needed that are involved in getting us there. I'm not a healthcare person. I'm not a, a, a scientist. I'm not an expert in that regard. But what I am an expert in is in humanity. And when you make decisions, you have to make decisions that balances the humanity and the, the literal life of people. And so I just wanted to share this on tonight and let you know that the decision that was made today caught me by surprise. Um, and I'm deeply troubled. And it is my hope and prayer uh, that um, the governor will respond to the questions that our subcommittee will uh, be sending to him, the concerns that we'll be sending to him. We don't know, you know, what the response or the outcome will be, but we will continue to move forward as a team uh, to work together to make sure that we are continuing to press on expanding testing sites and testing processes and testing procedures, because I understand that for many people, if a doctor doesn't refer you, that it's very difficult to get a test. Um, so all of that, concerned about people who are on the front line, who are not in the healthcare arena, having the necessary PPE, all of that, ensuring that there's connectivity uh, throughout the state of Georgia, because some people aren't even in the information loop because they don't have broadband access in our state. This is the time for us to rise up and do the right thing and to bridge the gaps that we have left unaddressed for so long. And so I want to thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm not sure I can answer any questions on tonight because I don't have all the answers. Somebody said he already made the decision without your input. You're not important. Well, maybe not to him, but I am important. <laughs> um, enough people did not die in the first wave, so the second wave is so much. I didn't get the rest of that. Low-wage workers in factories matter. Yes, they do. Trying to see if there are any more comments before I tune, in, tune out. Uh, blacks should protest against it. Yes, I'm encouraging you all to raise your voices in this. You do have rights and lives and families. You know, during the movement, uh, that my father led, um, you know, there, we, we at the King Center educate people on the process that they followed, the principles that they relied on to make sure that they were grounded in the right spirit and attitude and, and in, in a commitment to humanity and love. Um, and also the steps that they took um, to bring about change. They combined um, negotiation uh, with direct action. When negotiation failed, they employed what they call creative tension to bring people back to a table so that certain demands can be met. Now is the time for you 
to help us make these demands. Um, and so thank you for joining us on tonight. I appreciate you. Um, continue, please continue to stay hopeful. Continue to be prayerful. <laughs> continue to be wise. Continue to be safe. Um, and continue to shelter in otherwise. Uh, thank you very much. And please have a good night.